Uh, good morning, uh, good morning everyone, or good afternoon, uh, or good evening. It depends uh, from uh, where uh, everyone is connected. Uh, today we have people con connected from everywhere, uh, uh, also from the West Coast in the USA, where it is around 8 o'clock in the morning, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, to everyone who, who is uh, connecting to this webinar. Uh, uh, with the title Implications of COVID-19 on Gender Equality in the Legal Sector. Uh, my name is Aldo Scaringella, I'm the founder of LC Publishing Group. Uh, so I would like uh, to say uh, thanks to everyone of you who is connected to our speakers uh, for their availability, uh, to one of our speakers uh, to have helped us in organizing this uh, uh, round table, round table uh, um, uh, Radwa Elsaman, thank you very much, Radwa. Uh, 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 Mahmoud Sharawi, thank you very much. Thank you, every one of you. I will leave now the world to Ilaria Yaquinta, senior editor, LC Publishing Group at Iberian Legal Group, uh, to moderate this uh, webinar. Um, have a nice time with us uh, and enjoy this webinar. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you very much, Aldo, also to you, and thanks to all the attendees that are joining us uh, today. We'll discuss about the impact that COVID-19 is having on uh, gender balance, uh, focusing on uh, the legal sector, which is uh, how most of you already know our main point of uh, attention. If you have questions, please uh, click on the Q&A icon to send them uh, to us, the Q&A icon on Zoom also indicate in the speaker you would like to answer in case you have a preference. Otherwise, we'll see among our panelists who is available to give his or her view on uh, the specific topic you raise. In any case, we'll try to answer to your questions at the end of the discussion. Let me now introduce our panelists. We have uh, Mohamed Adel Gawad, partner at CERO, Raghi Soliman and Partners, Gada Kaisi Audi, Deputy Executive Director and Managing Attorney Care San Francisco Bay Area. Julia Brown Miller, Private Sector Development Specialist, the World Bank Group. Radwa Elsaman, Legal Consultant at Sofreco and Professor of Law at Cairo University of Law. Joan Fischlin, Head of Corporate External and Legal Affairs at Microsoft Gulf. Susan Permut, former Deputy General Counsel and Assistant Secretary EMC Corporation and Adjunct Professor of Corporate Governance at Boston University School of Law. Mahmoud Sharawi, Group Legal Director, Elsa Wedi Electric. Welcome to all of you. Let's start this uh, discussion from uh, the impact that this pandemic is having uh, on women, because this pandemic is impacting women in different ways, uh, not only at work, but also at home. Radwa, uh, what challenges do women in law um, are facing and uh, what are the strategies in your opinion uh, to overcome them? Sure. Um, thank you, Ilaria, for the question. And uh, before I answer the question, please um, uh, let me take a moment to uh, thank LC Publishing Group team for um, accepting to uh, host this webinar. And uh, thanks, Aldo and Helen, for making this happen. Of course, thanks to all our distinguished uh, guest speakers and special thanks to our audience for uh, taking time to attend our webinar today. Uh, getting back to Ilaria's question on the challenges facing women in the legal industry uh, during the crisis of COVID-19, uh, generally speaking, the pre-pandemic levels of inclusion were not that perfect, actually. One of the recent studies that has been made by the American Bar Association found that the average of female partners in law firms does not exceed uh, 20%. Uh, in the United States, for example, the Wall Street firms uh, started hiring women back in 30s, but um, uh, women started becoming partners in law firm uh, only in the 80s. Um, also, women uh, representation in the judiciary in the US, for example, is still 36%. In some developing countries, women were not allowed to join the judiciary until now. Accordingly, we had various challenges for gender equality before the pandemic crisis. In addition, 
Um, the pandemic crisis itself represents a huge backward step for gender equality. The obvious problem is that women started to juggle with their full-time professional obligations and home liabilities, including um, homeschooling, for example, or um, uh, child care and so on. The um, reported problems so far include the load of work. Lawyers were expected to work the same number of hours for, from home. Um, it's not a problem per se, rather a problem for women more than men, because of home responsibilities, as I have just explained, particularly in light of absence of support, for example, the daycare centers, um, the babysitting uh, services due to health concerns. Another reported problem is related to the unpaid care work. The COVID crisis actually revealed that our daily lives are built on uh, invisible um, and unpaid labor of women, which has increased during the coronavirus uh, with the children out of school and the overwhelming needed health services. Um, another re reported problem is the client demands, the never ending demands of the clients and partners, which made working from home becoming a 24 seven proposition, which was neither healthy nor um, sustainable. Um, also the downturns, when compensation cuts and layoffs have taken place, uh, women had the biggest share because they were viewed as the not sufficiently committed to their careers as reported by around 60% of female lawyers compared only to 2% of male lawyers, according to some recent statistics. And um, finally, the lack of available of resource availability of resources for women to participate in remote working, particularly when it comes to technology. Um, the strategies to overcome these um, challenges, really, there is no straight answer uh, um, uh, to this question, actually. Um, it really depends on the um, government support and the culture of the given legal market. But generally speaking, it remains the liability of the employers to adopt working policies that are more accommodating for women um, with flexible working strategies, um, health insurance plans and social insurance plans uh, that are able to face crisis and pandemics. Uh, expanding access to paid family leaves, for example, and uh, paid sick leaves, and uh, providing additional bonuses and subsidies, uh, vouchers for, to hire child services for women with care responsibilities, and of course, providing technical support in terms of technology um, training women on how to use different um, facilities related to technology. Law firms in particular should ensure um, diversity by restructuring firms to reflect gender parity. And house legal communities also should require law firms to provide diversity information and if possible to deal as much as possible uh, with small firms owned by female lawyers. From the government side, also, it's important to look at the social plans and economic plans uh, that provide cash transfer for some women at time of, uh, of crisis and um, run gender assessment in a given country to understand the impact of COVID-19 on uh, women in the legal sector and um, to have social assistance programs uh, that target women to the extent possible. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Radwa. So gender gap in law is just uh, widening because uh, the situation of uh, the gap was already known from uh, all of us. Uh, and as you said, over the last months, many women worked uh, and uh, uh, also now, many women are working from home, so in many households they are uh, primary caregivers uh, for children and relatives, uh, and so women need to juggle this, uh, this role of uh, parent, caretaker, colleague, uh, everything. Gada, uh, is working from home the same as remote working, and uh, what do you think about uh, what Radwa just said? Thank you, um, Ilaria, and thank you, Radwa, for really, you know, uh, really putting it in context for us. Um, well, first of all, you know, women have always worked. So if we trace the way women have worked from agrarian-based economies to now, you know, the fourth industrial revolution and the digital era, um, we, we've seen a lots of ebbs and flows 
during World War II with men on the battlefield and the front lines, women took to the workforce and the assembly lines. And then the notion that work should be inside the home, especially in the US, happened again during the Industrial Revolution. And then with the women's movement in the 70s and 80s, new opportunities opened up. But at the same time, um, wages started stagnating, and so families really became reliant on two incomes. And so to kind of jump into the second part of the question, there is a difference between working from home and re remote working. Working from home is a temporary situation, and it's usually considered a perk or a benefit. For example, you work in an office, but you stay home on a given day, and, or it's done on an occasion when you need to block uninterrupted time for yourself away from the day-to-day -day busyness in the office. You still have the framework and structure of your office and the people you work with at your office know how to adjust given your absence. But remote working of course can have different meanings. For example, it could be a satellite office um, as a spoke to a headquarters but the example I wanna focus on is remote working from your home. So remote working or working at home in a more permanent fashion means that everything about your remote work environment is different from your office where you had a workspace or a desk and coworkers. And that difference really deserves some attention by employees and managers. It requires a different set of abilities, resources and skills. It requires a self-starting attitude and well-honed time management skills. It also requires proactive communication and a vigilant focus on what's happening with your team members mm -hmm. as you don't have that regular face-to-face -face time. The question is really how have workplace policies changed in addition to the behaviors of women, men, women and men during these times? How have societal structures changed in comparison? Some like Eve Rodsky, the author of Fair Play, call this in-home work, emotional labor, mental load, and invisible work, as, as Rudwa mentioned as well. And she questioned, um, how did she end up being the default or the she-fault for all household responsibility? As Rodsky puts it, there's a different expectation of how women are supposed to use their time two thirds or more of the time it takes to run a household or family falls upon women. So it comes down to society's view on parenting as well. There's a different expectation of how women are supposed to use their time. It's the fact that women think to earn their leisure time or time for themselves, the only way to do that is to complete all the to-do list, all of those responsibilities. To continue to prioritize children and families, women have given up their leisure time, including time for sleep, personal care, and adult relationships. We hear this a lot now, put on your mask before helping others. In my blog, modernarabwoman.com, I delve into these issues. And this can be done by having a well-being plan, for example. Um, I, I did a piece called self-love in the time of coronavirus. And when you set up a well-being plan, you're prioritizing your routines and you're, you're taking time to stay connected and also engage in your hobbies. So the lines between work and home have blurred due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And more than ever, working parents are struggling to balance all of the responsibilities that have come with having a career and managing a household. It's heightened the parental responsibilities and the support systems have been diminished as Radwa explained. Children still have school and daycare before when we were working from home, but now it requires a new level of supervision by parents to make sure that the kids are logged onto remote learning per platforms and are doing, um, taking care of their day-to-day. So during the pandemic, this is not normal working from home or remote working. It's triage, it's survival. And companies I think should be very careful about using metrics on success of remote working right now. 
Yes, that's very that's very interesting also because uh, well being uh, um, well being was uh, very important for lawyers also before considering that uh, there are plenty of researches that shows that lawyers are among the saddest workers in the world. So well being uh, it's uh, it's really important. Uh, it's uh, I agree with you. It's a priority. Um, more uh, generally, uh, Joanne, according to the UN Women and uh, the UN Development Program, because of COVID-19, the poverty rate of women will increase and the gap between me, men and women uh, who live in poverty will increase too, obviously. How will this affect uh, women's ability to develop the necessary skills to enter the legal sector, in your opinion? Thank you, Ilaria, and let me also thank you, uh, LC Publishing Group, for uh, for having me uh, today amongst uh, the other esteemed panelists. It's a great opportunity to uh, to talk about this topic. Obviously, being at Microsoft, we're one of the key players in remote work. Uh, we pretty much shifted from one day to to the other, um, and it's very interesting. And I like what Khada concluded with, which. You know, statistics uh, might be positive, but we also have to uh, take into consideration um, the the negative side. Um, if you uh, if you allow me, before I jump into the question, I was writing a couple of data points as as Khada was 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 sharing some insights. If I if I look at obviously the statistics using Microsoft Teams, we've seen an increase in using Teams chat, for instance, uh, up to twenty three percent during working hours. But what's interesting is that. The use of Teams uh, chat outside of working hours uh, grew by 69%, mm -hmm. and it's grew by 200% over the weekend. So that kind of tells you how working patterns have uh, evolved and how basically people are juggling with both personal and professional agendas at the same time uh, during, uh, during the, uh, the uh, remote phase of work. Um, we've had 200 million Teams meetings participants in a single day. Uh, that's about 4.1 billion minutes of meeting every day. So and that also shows that this is really a, a, a global issue. Uh, now, segueing to, to the, the question, I, I kind of wanted to touch on those data points because extreme poverty might not touch our legal, our legal profession directly, but what we are seeing is that women are definitely uh, disproportionately uh, um, affected by the pandemic. Um, according to the uh, UN Development Programme and the UN Women Report, um, it appears that basically um, uh, 47 million more women are going to be pushed into extreme poverty by 2021, which is uh, a massive number. Um, that also means that the gap in extreme poverty between men and women is again going to widen. What is really saddening about this is that this is reversing decades of progress. We were typically expecting a 3% decrease in uh, women extreme poverty. And now we're looking at a 9%, more than 9% increase in, uh, in extreme poverty. The other item that really struck me and I think is relevant to, to um, our, our profession is the increased uh, re reports of domestic violence. And here you're not talking about developed world countries, you're talking about the likes of Germany, Canada, France, the US, you name it. And it's, it's heartbreaking when you already see that before the pandemic, um, domestic violence was already one of the greatest uh, human rights violations. For instance, if you just take the 12 months before the beginning of the pandemic, uh, 243 women and girls, so that's age between 15 and, and 49, were subject to sexual or physical violence by an intimate partner. And you, you even have to take that statistic with a pinch of salt when you know that 40% of women do not report on domestic violence. And now you have the pandemic that comes in and with, for instance, confinement, this is the, it, it builds the perfect storm. You have strain on security, you have strain on health, you potentially have money problems. Um, you have increased isolation from your usual support group. So, this basically means that um, regardless of your economic status, it appears that the pandemic is going to take a toll on women more than it's going to take on, uh, take on, on, on men. Our physical and mental health are potentially going to be impacted more 
I talked about domestic violence, Hada talked about well-being, about the fact that we juggle with a zillion uh, different items and we're expected to deliver both on professional but also on, on, on personal uh, liabilities. Um, and and what will what this story will will basically entail is that women will be stopped from participating in the recovery of our societies and and the economy. So what does this actually mean for the legal uh, profession? Again, um, my dear colleagues touched on this, but if I want to give you a scale, the Leadership Council on Legal Diversity is hoping that the pandemic is going to have less uh, of an impact on minorities including women, of course, than the Great Recession had. So in, in the space of, of a few years, uh, tens of thousands of lawyers typically had lost their jobs at the time. Female associates, especially of color, paying the heaviest price. Even if you looked at partnership ranks, women who at the time uh, made about 16% of equity partner nationally in 2007, half of these people lost their jobs. So. I, I want to. I kind of want to close on this with you know all of the above factors are, are basically going to have a new, an, an impact on women's ability to pursue higher education and to commit to highly demanded jobs. And unfortunately, both are um, great requirements of the profession that we uh, we all have the luxury of being in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susan, do you agree? And uh, secondly, I wanted to discuss with you about another word that is uh, very close to, to lawyers' word, that is the word of board of directors, uh, which is uh, also historical, uh, historically another word dominated by, by men. What has been the impact on uh, women on board of directors uh, uh, in the US, especially regarding the diversity on boards and will this pandemic will this pandemic impact also on uh, what you have done so far thank you Alaria, for the question and thank you to lc publishing and especially radwa for inviting me and um, I'm, I'm glad to be here so um, i think my question is a bit counter cyclical to what um, some of the other panelists are describing in that um, people do expect that the pandemic will have a positive impact on board diversity and a positive impact for women. I'll give you some data and some ideas and then a little bit of, of a wrinkle in that. So um, a number of trends in corporate governance have really accelerated during the pandemic as a result of shareholder interests and shareholder pressure and board diversity is one of those. Um, over the last several years, the the push for board diversity has largely been focused on women and women have made great strides. Now in the United States, um, after the events this spring and the uh, significant increase in the racial justice movement, there's been a bit of a shift um, in looking for ethnic and racially diverse directors on boards in the United States. So the question is, how is this going to impact, how is this shift going to impact gender um, equality on boards? And so the, the, the pressure for board diversity comes from multiple sources, um, including but not limited to shareholders. And, and, and some of these have increased their pressure during the pandemic. And I'll also mention a couple of interest, instances rather of state legislation which, which are new, which is also of interest. So um, California was the first state in the United States to have a quota um, for women on boards of directors. And this was um, went into effect in 2018. Now I know in other jurisdictions you're perhaps used to quotas, but this was new in the United States. And this has had a big impact. Uh, this ap applied to companies headquartered in California. And this has had a big impact on the number of women uh, joining boards in California. So, um, and the data on board diversity, I have to say, I search for statistics and depending what you take as your subset, if you're looking at S&P 500, 1500, Russell 3000, you get statistics all over the place. So I just picked some statistics that I thought were the most representative. But um, what these show, so I had some Bloomberg data on the California law which shows um, that women accounted for about 
5% of the new board seats in California compared with about 31% across the US. So, so clearly an impact. Currently, um, according, this is according to Spencer Stewart's most recent data, women comprise about 26% of board seats in the United States, which is up about 10 uh, from, I'm sorry, up 10% over the past 10 years, up from 16%. Compared to that um, minority representation, and this is a different subset, this is the top 200 of the S&P 500, will say that Blacks represent about 10% of board seats, Hispanics and Latinos about 5%, and Asians about 4%. So you can see, and, and that's increased um, about 8% uh, over the last 10 years. So, so the female representation has increased significantly. And so in connection with the more recent push for racial diversity, last week in California, a new law was signed last Wednesday by the governor, which will um, require quotas for ethnic, well, underrepresented communities on boards of directors. And it's patterned after the, the gender um, bill. So one of the issues is that boards are of a limited size and the turnover is quite low. So boards may add one or two people every 12 or 18 months. So the question is if um, many, uh, so many board members and people involved in search currently see a significant demand for racially and ethnically diverse directors. So how is this gonna impact women? So um, shareholders and um, others who are pushing for a change in board composition do see this as a, uh, a trend that will increase overall diversity, both for ethnicity and gender, um, but with this temporary shift that there may be a temporary decline in the rate of increase for women uh, being added to, to new boards. And incidentally, people who I have spoken with and read who are doing board search see a, the most significant increase in search for women who are also ethnic minorities. So this overall, this is a good thing. This should be a good trend for women and for other minorities. Um, but we'll have to wait to see over the next 12 to 18 months what the data show in terms of how this uh, trend is impacting women compared to um, racial minorities. At least it seems to be a positive impact. Uh, yes. Another topic that pandemic is uh, raising awareness around is uh, sustainability. Uh, what has been uh, the impact on uh, women's involvement uh, in uh, sustainability initiatives, uh, Susan? To you again. Yes, yeah, I, I will again um, speak positively um, because this is another trend that has accelerated during the pandemic. Um, so I do believe that um, the increased focus on sustainability, on uh, the purpose of corporations, on stakeholder capitalism, all of these different aspects will have a positive impact on women. Um, so you might say, you know, um, wouldn't shareholders and other stakeholders kind of take their foot off the gas a little because so many boards and companies are in crisis and some have shown some more flexibility um, on corporations. However, others are only increasing the pressure and they see this as a, a major test of sustainability and stakeholder capitalism and their belief that um, a more uh, sustainable corporation with better governance will fare better during the pandemic. Just one aside, Alaria, that I'll mention is that um, in the United States, at least, there are many women with careers in sustainability and governance. So just as an aside, that should have a positive impact um, on, on that um, set of women in law and careers. But I, I'd like to mention one specific thing that should have a positive impact, and that's that at the end of August, the Sec U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission passed a new rule which requires human capital resource disclosure by public companies. And so to date, there's been very limited required disclosure. In fact, the only thing you had to put in your 10K was the, your number of employees. Well, now this um, new regulation that came into effect at the end of August requires 
disclosure about human capital resources that companies um, find material to how they manage the business and how they understand their business. And most commentators say this can't help but include a lot of data on uh, diversity and inclusion, composition of workforce, et cetera. So um, most stakeholders believe that this increased, and, and so the types of disclosure that um, commentators are saying, so this is principles based, it doesn't specify what you have to disclose. So depending on your company and your industry, you might disclose different uh, factors. There's been some uh, voluntary disclosure to date. And Joanne, I didn't take a look at Microsoft's proxy when I was looking at this, but you probably had, because I know your proxy is great, and you probably had some voluntary disclosure. What I've seen so far is that the voluntary disclosure has, has been a bit more on programs and initiatives. There's been some that have some quantitative data, but this should increase the quantitative data. And so people are saying that'll have uh, data on workforce composition, diversity, promotions, paid family leave, childcare allowances, flexible work arrangements, uh, workforce composition by race, ethnicity, programs related to inclusion, et cetera. So when people do believe that this will have, this increased transparency will have a positive impact if companies are required to disclose this, they uh, you know, may also uh, feel um, compelled or may try to increase their, um, the quality of their programs and their workforce. But in addition, shareholders will have more information within which to engage with companies on these topics, which have become only more important during the pandemic. And so um, we do expect more quantitative data and that more transparency should lead to more um, gender equality uh, in the workplace and uh, on boards of directors. Thank you very much for this positive uh, <laughs> outlook also because <laughs> it's a hard time for women. So it's, uh, it's very good to know and to see from figures that yes. there are some uh, yes. uh, chances also to be positive. Uh, yes, well, again, we'll have to see what the data show, but I yes. think people are optimistic now. Okay. Uh, John, do you want to add uh, anything? Because uh, I say I saw you, you were uh, saying yes. Absolutely. Sorry, I think the host, are you, can you hear me? I yes, now yes. yes. <laughs> Apologies. No, no, so uh, nothing really to, to add. I, I completely agree with, with Susan. I don't think that we now uh, concise the, I, neither the opportunity nor the nor the impact. So all of that data that will start flowing uh, uh, and and the transparency, most importantly, that will result out of uh, of this dynamic will definitely be uh, an opportunity for for you know civil society uh, women's advocates to to uh, to showcase more of the of the unfortunate gap that we are still seeing in the in in the profession and. I, I will uh, corroborate that, and, I'll, and if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about our um, law firm diversity program. Uh, that definitely, I think, will bring uh, an additional positive twist to uh, to this COVID nineteen situation. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Let me just remind to our attendees that they can send questions to us by clicking on the Q and A icon. They can indicate also the name of the speaker they would like to answer to that question if they have any preference. Otherwise, I'll ask to our speaker who wants to be a volunteer uh, for that uh, for that question. Uh, let's focus on a um, particular uh, topic, Radua. The topic is access to justice. Um, COVID-19 is uh, impacting women's ability to access justice, in your opinion? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Elaria. Actually, um, generally speaking, the rule of law and access to justice uh, remain the foundation through which people are able to uphold their rights and get protected. And um, applying this concept to women's rights, um, depriving women from access to justice during the pandemic 
had some negative consequences. Um, and by, by lack of access to justice here, we mean um, the closure of courts and um, the inadequate responsiveness, uh, sometimes in specific um, legal systems by uh, police members or prosecutors or even lawyers some other times. So um, the reported problems so far include um, the impact of the lockdown of family courts on um, ability to claim uh, alimony, um, custody, visitation rights, and um, protection orders sometimes. Um, another problem is related to domestic violence as uh, Joan has just um, mentioned. Um, the lockdowns and the emergency procedures um, have increased the existing crest for women in abusive relationship. According to the UN women, um, women reported uh, legal issues relating to domestic violence, um, 40 to 75% uh, more than men. The um, e-justice or uh, remote litigation also was a kind of challenging. Um, the process of digitalization of courts in the systems that have uh, remote justice um, um, uh, mechanisms um, has resulted in the exclusion of women more than men. Uh, usually women face large barriers to technology, um, particularly in developing uh, countries. Um, for example, a recent study by um, Harvard shows that two thirds of men in some countries own a phone uh, compared to only one third of women. Um, they use India as an example. Also the risk at home or places, at some workplaces, sorry, um, risk at some workplaces. By this, I mean that um, specific um, uh, types of um, utilities, in, such as nursing homes and psychiatric um, units, and uh, some other similar um, service um, units have been witnessing high level of violence due to the lack of external oversight uh, during the pandemic time. Um, finally, the um, migrant women, um, refugees, um, asylum seekers, and um, internally displaced women seeking to enforce their rights during the crisis have also faced uh, some challenges, uh, particularly when court systems uh, stopped wor working for a while. The um, we have um, um, like we had seen so many uh, strategies adopted by different legal systems and um, many scholars talking about the lessons learned from um, um, the challenges facing access to justice during the pandemic time for the future, including mainly responsiveness. Um, by responsiveness, they mean um, having inclusive strategy that's timely and efficient for a functioning uh, justice system during crisis times in general. And, um, and instead of uh, having to have full trials, courts can issue interim judicial orders to ensure the immediate safety and well-being of women and children, uh, also including women um, as decision makers, um, women judges and female, female police members and uh, prosecutors uh, play a very important role in shaping the um, justice for women. Uh, securing access to technology is also very important and uh, spreading awareness of the importance of providing legal aid for the vulnerable gr groups or minorities um, in, through the cooperation between different stakeholders in the legal field. Um, Ministry of Justice, Bar Association, Civil Society sometimes. And um, actually, before I conclude my answer to this question, I would just like to um, elaborate a very, on a very important um, related issue, which is the women in business or entrepreneurs uh, and access to justice. Um, the important strategies um, uh, uh, to enable or to, to save or protect women in business included um, reducing the costs for litigation for small and medium enterprises, which is very important, particularly in countries which economy counts more on small and medium enterprises. Uh, increasing the use of um, alternative dispute resolutions. Um, specifically, we talk here about the pre-litigation mediation at courts uh, because it, it, it helped reduce the um, number of claims or, um, uh, I mean, uh, cases brought before courts. Uh, improving women uh, entrepreneurs' access to legal aid also is very important. And um, improving the legal awareness of women entrepreneurs themselves by providing 
legal training and capacity building on how to sign contracts, um, how to get loans, um, the important related issues from labor law, tax law, and the use of court system itself. And uh, finally, strengthening the um, judiciary capacity on the entrepreneurs' matters, particularly when it comes to capacity building of judges and um, other uh, relevant members of the judiciary. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Julia, uh, I know first of all that you are collecting data on the same topic and I also saw you nodding uh, while uh, Radwa was uh, speaking. So first of all, I would like to know your opinion on that. And secondly, another thing that I would like to know from you is that uh, what we have uh, heard, heard so far and also what we have observed uh, as a legal uh, market operator in, uh, uh, in different countries uh, over the world, uh, we have uh, recognized that uh, across uh, law firms, uh, uh, impact, the impacts of uh, this pandemic uh, and uh, um, the response of the organizations uh, uh, and law firms to this pandemic uh, are very different. Uh, and I wanted to know um, what are the responses uh, of uh, the legal system to address uh, the need of women during this crisis uh, to uh, what you know? Um, yeah, thank you, Ilaria and uh, Radwa and uh, Khada, Joanne, Susan. Um, I think all the most important points where we see the impact of this crisis on uh, women's work um, have been raised. Um, how the stay-at-home orders, uh, you know, may increase uh, instances of domestic violence. How it impacts uh, women's ability to work, uh, school closures, court closures. What I like to do before going into the responses is take a step back and remind us that um, even in normal times, women's basic rights are legally restricted. And we shouldn't forget that. When we talk about responses and legislators and policymakers, how they respond to the crisis, do not forget that even in normal times, women um, face basic restrictions on mobility and assets um, and accessing that. And that's what we do. So my uh, project at the World Bank Group is called Women, Business and the Law. And we have a truly global perspective on these issues because we um, collect data on 190 economies around the world to see how laws restrict or enable women to participate in the economy. And our main finding is that across these 190 economies, so across the world, women only have three quarters of the economic rights afforded to men. And our index that we have established shows that only eight countries out of the 190 um, have the full score. So in all other countries, we see restrictions on uh, women's mobility, on women's access to assets. Um, and we try to capture reform. Uh, how these uh, evolve over the years. Let me give you two examples that I think can be important to all the um, topics that we've already covered. Um, one is that in 21 economies around the world, a husband can legally prevent his wife from working. So the law poses that restriction on intra-family or intra-household dynamics. And of course, that is now exacerbated through the COVID-19 crisis if we work at home. Um, we heard about the undue uh, burden on women because of uh, care and uh, childcare um, responsibilities. But if the law already allows a husband to like just tell a woman to stay at home and not work, that is something we should consider when enacting COVID-specific measures. Um, the same, uh, another example is in 76 economies around the world, women don't have the same uh, rights to property as men. There can be unequal inheritance laws, it can be inequalities in the marriage laws when it comes to administering property. Um, and that affects uh, women's property rights. It affects access to collateral that women can pledge when applying for a loan. And we know that right now with the economic downturn, women's entrepreneurship is key to keep the economy going. But if women's access to credit is restricted by unequal property rights, we're posing an additional burden on women's um, entrepreneurship. So I think that's what we really should look at also when looking at COVID-19 related measures, not only what is um, a specific measure that we can um, enact now to promote women's economic um, entrepreneurship and participation, but what's a restriction in the overall legal framework. Um, and then of course, when it comes to responses, so thank you, Ilaria. 
asking for responses. Um, what we've done at our research project is in order to, um, in addition to collecting just the data on the 190 um, countries that we cover uh, for our index, uh, we also added research questions on responses from the justice system. Um, and so there are the three main areas that we talked about. Uh, one is employment and childcare. The other one is access to courts and the third one is domestic violence. And so I just wanna give some more uh, concrete examples because I know these areas have been raised by my co-panelists. And again, I think we're in a unique um, position at the World Bank that we can cover all these uh, countries uh, with examples. Um, so when it comes to gender discrimination in employment, again, the idea that because childcare centers are closed, uh, women take on uh, more domestic work. And um, there's actually a new study that I've just read on NPR that women are leaving the workplace at four times the rate of men because they can't shoulder um, all the care work. So we know that women are leaving the job market and here um, justice systems should, uh, or policymakers should uh, respond by making paid leave to care for a child available. And that is what we're seeing in many, many countries, it's actually a very uh, popular measure. We've seen it in Argentina, in Argentina, in uh, Romania, and in South Korea, that there's new paid leave policies available. Um, and we're also seeing that financial subsidies are given to uh, take care of children. And that's in Italy, where I know many of you are based. So that's a great good practice that we're seeing, or in Poland, for example. Um, then the second area that we're researching and that uh, Radwa had mentioned so eloquently already <laughs> is access to courts, um, especially family courts, um, court closures, stay at home orders, uh, impact women when they're trying to uh, seek justice for child custody, financial obligations, child alimony, child support. Um, and so here, uh, I think two things are important. One is that uh, courts stay open if they're considered essential or urgent cases. And we've seen that, um, that even during the lockdown, uh, for example, in uh, the Dominican Republic and in Singapore, family matters were essential. So the courts were still addressing those issues. Um, and similarly in uh, Botswana and Turkey, domestic violence cases were essential. So they were also still covered. And on the other hand, it's important to be able to access uh, courts remotely through electronic filings, uh, video conferences, virtual hearings or virtual courts, as we call them. And we've seen that in Nigeria, where uh, Skype or Zoom hearings are now a thing, and uh, in Chile, where electronic filing guidelines have been enacted. So it's really great to see all these varied responses from all over the world. Um, and so kind of the third issue uh, that's related domestic violence. Again, one thing is going to a court to obtain a protection order. Um, the other thing is uh, a response uh, that I think is very important is that just uh, do, uh, protection orders can be automatically extended. So you kind of eliminate the need to go for, um, for a proceeding. And then um, of course, like how do I access services? How do I access services um, as a, a survivor of domestic violence? Um, such as uh, health and uh, safety. And again, the idea that shelters, for example, they can be uh, declared essential services, so they should not be affected by any lockdown measures. Of course, safety in place as well, but that is essential, that is urgent. Like the needs of women should be um, regarded under any measure. Uh, then I can establish hotlines as a remote way um, to address, uh, to access legal or health services. Uh, we've seen that in uh, Jamaica, for example, and also really nice initiative in uh, East Asia and Pacific where social media was engaged in uh, supporting uh, survivors of domestic violence. Twitter uh, released a hashtag that directed, um, the hashtag was uh, there is help. And so women could directly be uh, um, directed to like shelters and NGOs to find help. So it's really uh, new technologies, mobile services, and, and access of women to these services that is key, as well as just considering the needs of women in any measure that is enacted. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Mahmoud, um, what is the role of men in this uh, challenge to reach uh, gender balance at work in your opinion? And also I would like to know from you uh, how local laws and regulation in uh, Egypt, Africa and Gulf countries have uh, 
um, and been focusing uh, and addressing the employment condition uh, for uh, women, uh, their benefits and their rights also in this uh, period. Definitely. Thanks. Uh, thanks you, Ilaria. Thanks for Elsie Publishing also for this important webinar. And thanks for Radwa for arranging for this uh, new topic that we are talking about. Let me uh, give you a quick brief, um, firstly, about um, women in, uh, in Egypt and how we are dealing with the situation all around. Um, for your knowledge, Egypt is a population of 100 million, which are, we have 48.5 million are women. Uh, we have a special uh, council for women, which is a national council for women, which is mandated for national women's machinery in Egypt. And it proposes a responsive politics to women needs, legislations, actions plan, uh, as well as all con it conducts some trainings, programs, and awareness for uh, women. It has 27 active local branch, and it reached about 40, 24 million women beneficiaries all around uh, Egypt. Um, women are more likely to be frontline health workers in Egypt. Uh, they make around uh, 42.4% of human doctors and 91.1% of nursing staff uh, actually working in the Ministry of Health, in addition to about 73% of nursing staff in hospitals and medical facilities in the private sectors. So you can imagine how important are they in, in, in this situation that we are now concerning the pandemic we are facing. Uh, women are also more likely to be engaged in short-term and part-time employment contracts which offer poorer social insurance, a pension and health insurance schemes. They get lower payments and uh, particularly at risk in economic downturn. Uh, after the COVID-19, it poses actually serious threat to women's engagement in economic activities, especially in, in informal sectors in Egypt. Uh, we have around 18% of women are heads of households. 41% are uh, non-agricultural employment in informal employment. Uh, we have about 6.7% of female employment in industry. 36.4% are uh, employment in agriculture, while seven, around 57% employment in services. Egyptian women represent 70% of paid care sector workforce, mainly as teachers, health, and social workers. Uh, and as Suzanne said, we do have also a quota about women in the parliament, and we do have also a quota in the board directors concerning the listed uh, joint stock companies in Egypt. Concerning the regulations and laws, in, uh, in March 2020, uh, the government had took uh, some decisions related to supporting women after the COVID. It has suspended all works in universities, schools, and nurseries. Uh, it grants uh, the pregnant employees and or working mothers with a child below 12 years old an exceptional vacation during uh, so exceptional vac well, yeah, during the decree validity it's, it's till now it's valid this decree it grants working mother with a handicapped child exceptional paid leave without losing her job or promotions it provides all medicines related to chronic diseases infant formula and family planning method for free it has a protection and extra care for elderly women and women with disabilities who live in nursing homes. It increased the monthly social payment for rural women leads. Uh, it, the privilege for women to take loans with minor interest and long payment terms for micro projects have been uh, put in place. Uh, the Ministry of Manpower has granted extra payment amount for workers in general and women in specific. That's for Egypt. Uh, I also have compared the same in, in UAE. So we have two main decrees in UAE related to the um, situation after the COVID. We have the Ministry of Human Resources and Immortalization Resolution uh, 279. Uh, it was also in April concerning the employment stability in private sector. The resolution encouraged employers to consider alternative means of reducing staffing uh, and staffing costs, definitely, rather than terminations. It makes clear that certain measures should be with an employee's express written agreement. Uh, according to this resolution, employers may mutually agree on with one of the following with the employees, remote working or having a paid leave or having an unpaid leave 
or temporary reduction of salary or permanent reduction of salary. Uh, also, they had a new system, which is a concept related to sharing employees, whereby employers with a surplus of non-national employees may register to the ministry a virtual labor market system uh, to enable such employees to work for other employers. Another decree was number 281 uh, in 2020 related to precautionary measures also, which uh, have um, limits the percentage of employees' workforce to 30%. Uh, companies are also required to limit the number of customers visiting uh, to premises to 30%. And for employees working remotely, employers' priority should be given to pregnant women, those aged uh, are 55 and above, those with disabilities uh, and chronic diseases, and female workers who are mothers for children in grade nine and below. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, following uh, these uh, the, these measures, uh, um, uh, what is the private and public sector response uh, to COVID-19? Uh, are they following uh, strictly these measures? Are they adding uh, other measures? And uh, do you think that uh, all these measures will be enough to avoid uh, that the gender gap uh, widens uh, more? Actually, in Egypt, for the public sector, uh, all public sector arms and related authorities, they did apply the rules and regulations related to women work environment, and they allowed for unpaid leaves uh, or remote work if possible for women. Uh, government is now also working hardly to uh, minimize the paperwork and trying to increase the remote and online services, which helped everyone and definitely women uh, to avoid any extra problems from the COVID-19. For the private sector, I will take my company or our group as an example. In uh, We have uh, issued a decree related to the reduction of workforce to 50% of the total number of employees, uh, privilege for women to take paid leave if required. Um, all married and pregnant women uh, and women with children have the right to work from home 100%. They don't come to office at all. Employees have the option to select some desk and chair so you can have imitate of work environment uh, in your home. Uh, also, high speed internet is also so which make life easier to work from home. Uh, technology also was one of our uh, important uh, focusing the last decade, and uh, we have invested in the technology a lot. We have equipped our meeting rooms with interactive screens, smart conference systems. We have deployed full remote management system for 24 seven monitoring services. We have applied Office 365. We have uh, using all effective communication platforms like WebEx, Zoom and Microsoft Teams. And we have applied electronic signature whenever uh, possible. Some of the private sector in Egypt have responded negatively to the social circumstances and they decided to terminate employment agreements for women, uh, alleging that there are instability and low performance during the COVID, but likely this wasn't uh, the case in, in our group. Uh, for UAE, for the public sector, uh, we have checked and found that they have been totally stick to the uh, decision and decrees that have been taken in UAE, public sector, we have uh, totally respected the decrees and allow women to work 100% from home if uh, needed. For the private sector, actually it differs, not all on the same page. Some companies terminated the employment contract of women, as I said, for low performance or for instability from the side. And some companies have respected the laws and reduced the salaries by mutual agreement to 50% and kept them employed without termination. Thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud. Uh, Mohamed, uh, mm, first of all, why it is important for men if it is to engage on uh, gender issues? And secondly, if do you think that companies uh, uh, should uh, rethink uh, benefits uh, for women and uh, workers in general? And uh, if this can be a solution for uh, the issue we are discussing today? 
Thank you, Elaria. Thank you, Dr. Rodwa and LC Publishing for uh, inviting me uh, to this um, um, uh, very interesting topic, which um, um, I believe on the personal uh, level um, is one of um, uh, my key uh, objectives to, to work on. Uh, I think I, I may have a little bit different uh, perspective um, from a big picture perspective regarding gender equality and, and treating women. Maybe I'm um, affected by my community, but I think it will have some sort of, uh, of global impact uh, um, in, in different uh, countries and different communities. I think the issue uh, when it comes to addressing the gender equality uh, is that we always try to uh, find ways for women to adapt to the norms, to the existing norms. And uh, I think existing norms, work, working norms in the legal profession uh, specifically, and, and also I think this may apply to um, other uh, professions, uh, is designed in a way that does not uh, appreciate and uh, does not adapt to the needs, the human needs of both women and men, maybe due to uh, the nature of the, the role of women and men in our community and in most of global communities, uh, men can adapt to these conditions, but women are not able to, to adapt to them. I think the issue with most initiatives trying to equate between women and men is that they are trying to ch change the norms of women for them to adapt to the existing norms that we have at work. Uh, I think this perspective is not fair, and I believe, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Um, I share Susan's the positive view. I think that the COVID-19 uh, was actually an outstanding opportunity for us to rethink uh, this concept. Um, regarding the benefits, uh, when we look at them, we will find the benefits uh, that are there in all laws deal with normal circumstances. We, we have specific number of days for accidental leaves, uh, which comply with the norm that we all used to, uh, uh, to have. Uh, we have part-time arrangements that are usually not favorable to bus businesses and seen as something exceptional to the norm. And when it comes to flexible hours, uh, we find most law firms and, and, and legal professionals uh, annoyed by it, and they think that it does not work properly. Uh, I think that the, the good uh, aspect in COVID-19 is that the change of this dramatically, and we had uh, all to shift to uh, a different nature and different norms. We had all to shift to what I can say the normal working uh, life for women before COVID-19, and, and men had to try this. Uh, and to see how difficult it is, and interestingly, from our own experience in, in the law firm, we can also see how when women became better and actually became more advanced in dealing with this extraordinary situation. So in our team, we have a majority of, of female lawyers, and they are used to adapt to these unconventional circumstances because the community always used to push them to try to meet the standard norms, they had to work flexible hours. My wife, for example, she's in, in marketing, uh, she's a marketing professor, uh, um, uh, but she prepared all her PhD from uh, uh, 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. for over three or four years. Uh, she had to work uh, um, um, at totally um, abnormal hours for the, for the normal uh, uh, working hours for an academic uh, scholar. Uh, so now we see this in, in work, we see that women can adapt better than men to these unconventional times. And interestingly, we see a challenge to the traditional norms that we thought work can only be done through this way, that flexibility is not a possibility and that we, we have to comply with a specific normal. Now, this, we, we, we all had to change this normal. When it comes to benefits, I think that legislators all over the world need to rethink this matter in Egypt. And I think in, in a lot of other countries, uh, 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 legislations uh, have been silent uh, in dealing with the exceptional benefits that the community, both men and women needed uh, 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 to deal with the situation. For example, in Egypt, we have only six accidental days 
uh, of leave in the law. Uh, you're not allowed to, to have additional days. With the pandemic, I think we can consume these six days in one month, not, not in a year. Uh, so of course, the legislations should address this in a way um, that will be a bit tricky because people can abuse the benefits. Uh, but I think there should be some governance rules to, to try to apply this. We have seen uh, uh, a lot of clients that mutually uh, uh, choose with, with their employees to put them on unpaid leaves. Uh, not all employees would have the same appetite towards risk. And if the, the, the working requirements uh, does not allow for flexibility, uh, um, choosing an unpaid leave definitely would be something uh, uh, important for people. When it comes to flexible hours and home working hours until date, we did not see any legislation that actually recognizes these working hours. Still in Egypt, we have the law as traditional law. You have your attendance hours to the workplace. And there is no even an interim legislation to address this situation. Uh, um, it is very ironic for me because I always felt that uh, uh, my wife was at a very bad position at the university. Uh, they are very strict when it comes to, uh, she's in the German University in Cairo. They're very strict, strict when it comes to the working times. So she gets deduction from their salary each month because she's not attending to the premises while she works more than six hours a day at home. No one recognizes this. Ironically, now we are in this situation. Obviously, private sector is recognizing the working hours from home, but we don't see any legislation addressing this and how this will reflect in the benefit. The last point regarding the benefits, I think it is very important that we look at it as family related benefits, especially when we talk about childcare, because having this, and this is the norm in Egypt, addressing these benefits to women only is not fair. And it is very important to have a balance. And this is the important equality. Some people think that this is an advantage for women, but ironically, it's not, because when women are granted advantages, uh, um, uh, again, only without men for more child care, actually the duties, the home duties are automatically focused on women and we are not trying to change this. So I think rethinking uh, benefits is very important. And uh, in the legal profession specifically, I, I, the, the, the previous talk, I think it's more general on, on businesses in general. On, on the legal community specifically, uh, it's, it's the whole business is about people. And the competition between the key players is uh, about who can attract the better talents in the market. Uh, I think the next game is about job offering. Who can give the best job offering to their employees? Talking about statutory benefits could be challenging because uh, um, it would have impact on businesses. I think it's important to talk about statutory transparency where the legislator requires employers and legal professionals to be transparent on their policies and their benefits that they offer their employees and they commit to it. Because currently I think a lot is in the gray area, whether you, you don't know whether you are allowed to have flexible hours or not, you're waiting every week to see whether you will go back to office or not and things are not really clear what's the, 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 the offering there. So I think that's on, on, on the benefit side, uh, uh, um, what, what I see is relevant to uh, uh, the, the, the impact of COVID-19 on, on women's uh, work. Thank you very Thank you. much, uh, Gada. First of all, your opinion on what you have heard uh, from your colleagues. And uh, secondly, another thing that uh, uh, COVID-19 is challenging is uh, recruitment process. Uh, how has uh, recruitment changed uh, during the pandemic? And uh, could this uh, change create greater opportunities for diversity and inclusion or not? Thank you, Ilaria. Um, sure, I do. I want to touch on a couple of things. Um, first of all, Julia and, and others have raised some very good points that we've got very severe structural and systemic issues when we talk about gender in the first place. And it needs a lot of awareness. And I think this panel was very instrumental in bringing awareness to this issue. Um, and also following on from what Muhammad was explaining, um, I think we do have a lot of opportunities to really rethink the concepts 
um, we're not tied to the existing norms. And I think that does create um, a, a, a lot of opportunities for, for us to, to do things better and differently. Um, I do want to jump in a little bit on this question of, you know, how is re recruitment changed? And I guess it's it's important to also put it in the context of being in um, in the in the U.S. as the jurisdiction that I'm 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 looking at, and and even in the U.S. we have systemic issues to address. Um, but um, and before the pandemic, we we've had a lot of AI tools that HR departments can use to take gender and age and ethnicity out of the question. Um, so how how has it really changed? In my experience, um, I actually did apply and I interviewed and I onboarded for a new role fully remotely um, without ever having met my colleagues or hiring manager and without visiting the office. So I think that is what has changed. Um, people are not having a second interview in person or flying to meet the hiring manager. So I guess, again, I'm couching that in in a, a domestic office situation that still may be different in um, how or how we've hired remote office um, employees in, in other situations. But I also think that the idea that employees can work pretty much from anywhere opens up a broader pool of talent that you can hire. Um, so if you were going to hire a GC or an you know, assistant GC in the Bay Area, um, the organization would probably be interviewing people in the Bay Area, taking perhaps into account the cost of living. But now that employer can really tap into different legal markets and broaden the pool, which I think will have an upside on diversity. Um, and again, as Mohammed was just saying, you know, the lack of meaningful opportunities for flexible work had historically really been real. And now there's this barrier that's kind of been removed because we've seen that it is possible. And I think that can be something that really helps us as we look at ways to you know, achieve diversity and inclusion. Um, but there's still the structural things that we have to change beyond how we hire even. We have to also address how we compensate, how we evaluate and how we advance people. So, you know, right now we're, we're on a Zoom call and you can all see that all of our boxes are the same size. And that's changing as well, that within um, the company structure, it, it just looks differently. And I think even that's a, a, a very small anecdotal um, thing to point out, but it does signal and signify that we do have ways to, you know, to move forward and, and, and move the needle. Um, and I honestly would like to see in regard to the legal sector, uh, more surveys and studies on these changes that are resulting from you know, the crisis really creating opportunities to improve. I really don't think that I was able to find that much information. So um, it would be great that that's the kind of thing that I think LC Publishing and, and others could really help us with. So I'm not really sure yet that we've got the metrics and the verdict I think is still out, but I, I am also um, positive that we can use this as an opportunity to, to really push forward with real change. Thank you very much, Gada. Um, uh, another thing that is uh, really important uh, and uh, I wanted to cover is uh, related uh, to something that Joan anticipated before, uh, because legal departments around the world, the world are undertaking various action to push uh, for greater law firms uh, diversity. And you said before that, Microsoft has a specific program on this. Can you explain to us what do you do and why it is important in your opinion that corporate legal department and general counsels play a role in ensuring that the legal profession accelerate his efforts in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion? Yeah, so thank you very much, Ilaria. And thanks, Khada. I, I, first of all, I, I want to say that I, I totally agree on the hiring space and 
um, the pool basically of, of, of candidates that we will be able to tap in in the future is, is mind blowing. So this is typically one thing that I see as, as an immense benefit of, uh, of, of this pandemic and taking, uh, taking uh, corporations out of their comfort zone just to keep people close. Um, and, and this, you know, this, this pandemic has shown something. If you have the right tools, you can be efficient when you, when you work remotely. So thank you very much for sharing this. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm gonna share just a little bit on, on, on something that we've been doing at Microsoft for, for a while now. Uh, back in 2008, uh, we launched uh, our law firm diversity program. Uh, uh, I mean, ultimately this comes from the fact that even within Microsoft, we are very, very, very focused on diversity and inclusion. And if you look at even the corporate uh, external and legal affairs group, which I belong to, uh, we've always been focused on, you know, creating a legal profession that kind of reflects all of the people we serve. And as a global organization that caters to, to billions of people, how do you actually achieve this? And then we, the, the thinking was, okay, well, we do this internally. So we definitely should make sure that the legal profession in a broader sense uh, kind of you know, commits to, to, this, to the same uh, metric. So um, we put this, uh, this program together. It's basically an incentive program uh, that rewards participating firms for increasing their diversity in, in the firm. So when we talk about diversity, we talk about things like greater inclusion of women, racial and ethnic minorities, LGBTQ+, people with disabilities, I would say even in the US veterans also part of, part of that. And the, the metrics that we tried to, to put together were a couple. First of all, we expect diversity on the uh, attorneys and people that work on Microsoft Matters. Now, we expect a certain uh, amount of diversity in, uh, at partnership level and also at executive uh, level. Uh, this coming year will actually add to those metrics who've been around for, for a while. Typically, the diversity and partnership and exec management has been here since 2015. But the, this coming year, we're going to also add another metric, um, including African-Americans, Blacks, Hispanic, and Latinx in leadership uh, uh, in, in our partner law firms. So what's in it for the law firms? I think, you know, if you want to push people to move the needle on a topic, you need to incentivize them. So typically last fiscal, um, the, um, the, uh, the firm that would reach the targets would benefit from 2% of bonus on, uh, sorry, 2% of their annual fees as, as bonus if the targets were met. In addition to that, we have awards. So we award the top performer. Um, uh, so basically who's been the greatest uh, in gaining uh, diversity across all of those metrics. And the other thing that we also have, we have a most innovative um, uh, award. And that one is based on the participating law firms having to uh, vote for the most innovative diversity program or, uh, or event or whichever that others have basically put, uh, put forward. Um, so we're really happy uh, and there, there's tangible metrics that shows that this has been pushing uh, uh, the, uh, all of the our partner law firms in the right direction. So typically since the program launched, we're in the 12th consecutive year where diversity on the attorneys that work on Microsoft uh, matters has increased. Since we launched the management and partner uh, uh, composition metric in 2015, uh, we've had 12% increase in diversity in the management side and the partner composition moved from 33 to 38%. Now, those numbers are great, but at the same time, I think they reflect that there's still so much to, to do uh, for, for, for women and, and other, other minor, minorities. You might ask you, your, yourself a question, you know, why? And if I look typically at the, the US, uh, um, the US population by 2042, will not have a majority, it will be a majority minority in terms of there will be no um, race or ethnicity majority. So what that means, first of all, is that law firms and legal profession need to make sure that we, we, we adapt and we represent the people that we serve. 
and, and, and you can't fall short of proper diversity in law firm if you want to be competitive, if you want to understand your customers, if you really want to adapt to, uh, to, to the market. The other thing is, which is very unfortunate, if you look at other professions, for instance, that require higher education, the likes of surgeons or finance managers, auditors, um, most of those professions, unfortunately, always fall behind the average national workforce in terms of, of, of diversity. But what is striking is to see that the gap between these professions and ours is widening. So it really shows that the legal profession has a lot and a lot and a lot to do in that space to kind of bridge that gap. Um, and finally, I'll close with this. I, you know, Microsoft is a, is a massive organization. And of course, I, I believe that as, as such an organization, we, you know, we have an opportunity to make a difference, but we also have an accountability to do so. And, and, and the size uh, obviously allows us to be a, you know, quite pushy, I think, in terms of putting those targets uh, uh, towards our, our law firms. But first of all, I haven't seen one law firm who's not excited in actually participating in this, in this program. It's really healthy competition. And ultimately, I think any uh, organization can make sure that when they talk about diversity and inclusion in their, in their legal team, they can have an impact beyond the borders of, um, of their organization. Thank you, Joan. I have, uh, this is my last question before the Q&A. So just let me remind you that if you have any question, you just need to click on the Q&A and type your question for our speakers. And uh, my last question is uh, for Mohamed, because uh, you say during some exchanges that we had by email uh, uh, over the last weeks uh, um, before uh, this round table in order to discuss about the contents, you say the COVID-19 impact on challenging traditional work requirements that pose barriers on women career progression by creating a necessary conflict between family and work duties. What do you mean? Well, as I, as I, I said, I think um, the, the key problem with law firms is that they have put a specific framework where every lawyer has to go through in order to be successful. The definition of success within law firms uh, globally requires review. Um, I think I have heard a lot of that I mean, I hear during this, this discussion that uh, uh, lawyering is one of uh, the saddest professions worldwide. I think the reason behind this is the criteria that we put for ourselves um, sometimes. And, 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 this, um, and here I, I want to comment actually on a specific point that Joanne said, because I have seen how these policies are applied in jurisdictions in emerging markets like the Egyptian market, uh, where we uh, hear a lot of uh, these policies that in few years you will not be able to work with a lot of multinationals if you do not have a female partner and that there, there are specific requirements you need to meet. To be honest, I believe that the policy should, should, shall go beyond this and shall look into how these firms make female partners. Uh, uh, you need to have genuine female partners. What I have seen in Egypt and in my past experience that a lot of law firms actually rush into nominating female partners that are not qualified to be female partners, which ends up in my view uh, uh, to a very negative impact on gender diversity because you introduce uh, uh, female representatives that are not capable of proving to the society and pro proving to the profession that they are genuine and real and solid female partners. I agree with the policy definitely and we have to have these policies in order to advance on the gender equality but I think it's important to look into the norms and the requirements and the career path in these organizations. Um, um, I, I will just give uh, two examples uh, uh, that happened in my career, which, which I'm, I'm very proud of, and actually that made me believe in, in how this topic should be addressed. The first one started a few years ago when one of the best lawyers that I've worked with uh, 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 became pregnant and she was exchanging jobs. And as a typical thing that happened, the company and she got pregnant, they knew she was pregnant they found other justifications just to terminate her employment. 
And I convinced my firm at the time to hire her in her sixth month of pregnancy, which everyone was thinking that is very illogical. Why, why don't you wait? But I was investing in the relationship. She worked flexibly during these two months. She went on maternity leave and she came back and actually she gave more than 100% to the work. She added a lot of value. She added a lot of value to the environment. And most importantly, she set the example within this law firm and actually she set the policy, how this can work and how this can uh, uh, um, uh, be effective. The good thing that the position where women are in makes them more open to flexible arrangements, which I think now in, in this pandemic, the employers are more keen to have this type of flexible arrangements. For example, a part-time arrangement based on productivity, uh, you get paid based on the hours, the billable hours that you record. Normally, in, in the normal situation, you'll find women more open to these arrangements more than men. And in light of the COVID-19, where a lot of firms do not see uh, um, a lot of, do not have a lot of visibility on the expected workflow, they prefer to have these types of arrangements. It works very well. The second example actually is, is a, a very recent one. one. One of my colleagues now, we, 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 we had this friendship relationship for, for over 10 years. We used to work in 2009 together in, in the law firm in Cairo. She moved to law firm in Qatar and then she relocated to Aberdeen where she lived with, the, she had two kids and, and she did her master's degree. She, she got disconnected a bit from the Egyptian uh, legal market. And then we started last year to, to rethink, to explore the opportunity that she starts working. She did great. She started working from Aberdeen. And after two months, uh, she came to talk to me, disappointed that she had to move to Dubai uh, because her husband is moving to Dubai. And she was very disappointed, thinking that the relationship will end. But again, we were looking into value. And this is, again, I'm not talking about what we did, but this is how I see the organization should have their policies. So we decided to, to continue working and we found a lot of value when she goes to Dubai. A lot of clients are there already. And while the month she wanted, she, 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 she was moving in March and then COVID-19 hit everywhere and the opportunity that her husband had in Dubai did not work. And ultimately they came back to Egypt after 10 years. And now she's one of the key uh, 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 members of the firm providing, I think, exceptional value that is not available in the Egyptian market, not just from the legal perspective, but also from the combination of cultural and, and skill set that she had during her journey. So I think it's important to look into the organizations and their career path, their requirements. If you find in this path something that is, uh, uh, from my point of view, um, um, unreasonable, something based on a timeline, for example. It's normal for people, men and women, to slow down at certain points for certain circumstances in their career. And the organization should allow for this smoothly. So I think I agree with the policies of the multinationals. I believe that these will push the, the, the law firms to, to comply and to, to allow this. I have seen this in local firms and I also have seen this in international firms through their Egyptian offices that in their global uh, um, uh, promotion also, they get affected uh, arbitrarily from these policies just to check the box and say we have these female lawyers. Uh, so let's keep this as a good policy, but let's use the pandemic, changing uh, um, how we approach work, how we do work, uh, and, and not just the flexibility, but we, we have to rethink everything. Uh, what's the value that we are providing to our clients? Um, um, not just the, the, the legal service, the legal advice, the way of communication, the flexibility uh, um, in, in reaching out and, and, and actually start uh, appreciating this value. I think this will give women fair treatment. This will give them fair opportunities. And more importantly, when we have a female partner, uh, uh, um, it, we will have a real female partner that is that represents a role model and actually that paves the way for all other women to to go through the, through this route the way i have seen in in my life with with my colleagues who actually successfully uh, did this thank you
Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let's start the, the Q&A. We have a question, I'll read it. Very interesting what Susan said about the switch of focus from gender to other racial diversity after the spring events. Do you think that we are going to see something similar also out of the States, in particular in Europe soon? Susan, do you want to answer? I, it, very interesting question. I'm afraid I really don't have the data for Europe at all, but I would suggest that you would uh, go country by country because I do believe that the laws on the boards are different in different countries and the laws are different in each country. I remember when France implemented a quota for women on boards a number of years ago, I thought it was a good opportunity for me to brush up on my French. <laughs> but of course, I, I didn't do that. Um, in any event, um, really, each, each country is different. Some countries I know require employee, employee representation on boards. So I think that's a very interesting question, but you, you'd really need the data. And then anecdotally, I've seen uh, written and spoken to a number of people who are on boards in the US who are on uh, at search firms. So some of the current information is really anecdotal, but for many people who are involved. So I think you'd have to, you know, kind of roll forward your information to see what the current experience has been in uh, in each country. Thank you. Anyone wants to answer also to contribute to this question? If you just raise your hand, uh, the control room will uh, switch on your microphone and uh, give you the chance uh, to speak. No one else? Joanne, maybe. Oh, I think Susan was very eloquent. <laughs> so no, unfortunately, I have nothing, uh, nothing to add. I, other than it is very much uh, dependent on on uh, the legislation of, of, of each country, unfortunately. So you wouldn't have uh, typically European data on that point. Julia raised uh, her hand. Um, yeah, I just want to take this opportunity um, actually uh, to end with a call for action, if you don't mind, because um, I'm really impressed that we're all kind of talking about the same topics um, and we have so much expertise from so many really distinguished law firms. Um, so I just wanted to say, um, if you like to share this expertise with my team, we would be incredibly grateful because um, there was, you know, the need for data was mentioned and there isn't enough data. So that's exactly what we're trying to do at Women, Business and the Law. We record um, the answers from the legal systems and 190 economies. So, and how do we do this? Obviously we can't do all this by ourselves. We work with uh, local legal experts, including law firms and NGOs who fill out our questionnaires and submit the data to us. So if you go to our website, it's wbl.worldbank.org, Women, Business and the Law. Um, at the World Bank and you can also reach out to me and send all these great examples that, that you've shared so we can uh, publish them in our annual report and hopefully produce good data for governments when they're looking for good practices. So that'd be great, thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. We have uh, no further questions. So unless, uh, uh, oh, let me check. Ah, okay, it's just a thank you uh, for, uh, for the answer um, and uh, so also Julia if you can paste uh, the link uh, also in the chat uh, so that uh, our speakers can uh, or our attendees also can see uh, the link um, let me check Thank you. It's just a thank you. I thought it was a question. We have no further questions. So thank you very much for this uh, very interesting discussion to our panelists. And uh, thank you also for uh, the attendees, uh, to the attendees for uh, uh, staying with us and uh, following us uh, with this discussion. Uh, let me just uh, say hello to everybody. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. That was a great discussion. Thank you. Very Thank impressive. You. Thank you. Really appreciated it. <laughs>